Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Hello, wildlings. In the present day, we often hear of the dangers of the internet and of mass media and social media in general. That such things are vectors for all sorts of malicious machinations and misinformation. Well, it turns out that's been going on for a lot longer than you might think, as illustrated in tonight's tale of malintended memory, and incidentally, the finale of the original trilogy, part three of Butcher Face by Dash 32. All right, here's the final chapter. No surprise, it'll also be long. After Chris's father burned Butcher Face's media, including the art, photos, and tapes, I think everyone, including me, hoped that Chris would let it go. I know I was willing to let it go, but it wasn't long after that that instead he began looking for any evidence of other media by the same person. He would occasionally talk just to me about strange tapes and art found in other parts of the country, but most of it seemed sketchy, which even Chris was completely willing to admit. My attitude began to change about looking into Butcher Face around this time, when I was sitting at my desk and caught myself absentmindedly drawing Butcher Face's CV symbol on a piece of paper that I was supposed to be drawing Batman on, which is a different story altogether. Roughly two weeks after Chris's dog disappeared and his father burned all the evidence that we'd accumulated, Chris showed up on my doorstep, saying that he wanted to go back to the house that we had found that was on the tapes. When we first found it, no one was home. That was back in part two, if you remember. We showed up at the house around 6 p.m. on a Wednesday, hoping that anybody living there would be home from work. We went to the door and knocked. The person who answered the door was a man roughly in his 50s, it turned out that he did actually live in the house in the mid-80s when we believed that the tapes were shot. We told him about the tapes and that his house was on them and asked if anything strange had happened around that time. He said that they had nothing like what was on the tapes, but there was a point where they realized that someone had been living in their shed in the backyard. The shed had since been torn down. But he did remember that there was a carving left on the doorframe. We asked him what it was, and he pulled out a pad of paper and drew the CV symbol. That very next day, Chris's mother was walking around in their backyard and came across their dog. He'd been ripped open from the neck to the stomach and placed in the still open hole that his father had dug two weeks earlier. The cops had been called and they were finally told about Butcher Face. Since his dad had burned everything, they really had no evidence that the dog had been killed by a person and labeled it an animal mauling. It wasn't long after that that I came home to find my front door open. I walked up the front steps and saw that the door was slightly swinging open, only hanging on one hinge. It being dark out, I flipped the light switch just inside the door, and it didn't come on. I went around the house to the shed in the backyard and grabbed the most menacing thing that I could find that was near the door, which happened to be a pitchfork. Going back to the front door, I pulled out my cell phone and called 911. After making the call, I cautiously entered the house, making sure that the pitchfork was out in front of me. I crept up the stairs and got to the nearest light switch and flipped it, but this one wasn't working either. I came to the conclusion that the power had been cut. Uh, using my cell phone as a flashlight, I got a look at the damage that had been done. The leather couch had been slashed open with dozens of cuts and the filling pulled out and the glass doors in the kitchen cabinets had been smashed. 
More than half the liquor bottles in the liquor cabinet were missing, and the medicine in the medicine cabinet was also gone. It all seemed very familiar. I mean, even my 13-year-old dog's arthritis pills were taken. Speaking of the dog, his name's Drake. He, uh, has an anxiety problem, so we keep him in a crate whenever we leave the house. Now, thinking back to what happened to Chris's dog, I panicked, ran down the hall to the office where his crate is kept. I shined what little light I had from my phone on the crate and saw that its door was open and it looked empty. I stepped forward, afraid at what I'd see, and shone the light into the crate and saw Drakey cowering in the back, whimpering. That's when the cops pulled up. My family came home soon afterwards, and when the cops asked us if we had any enemies, since the house mostly just seemed to be tossed, I had to tell them about Butcher Face. While the police were looking around, they noticed that the power hadn't been cut. It turned out that every single light bulb in the whole house had been partially unscrewed, leaving the light bulb in the socket, but not able to light up. This was the first time my family had heard about Butcher Face, and uh, they asked me to stop talking to Chris. So I hadn't so much as talked to him on the phone for almost two months after that. Very little had happened in that time, but something still didn't feel right as well. For one thing, my sister, who works nights, started asking me to stand at the front door and wait until she got into her car whenever she left, since she has to leave after dark. I asked a couple times why, but she never really gave an answer. It's like she just felt creeped out, or like she was being watched whenever she went outside. Our dog still seemed to be spooked, too. Whenever we'd tie him outside, he'd only do his business and then come right back in, which is very out of character for him. One day, I was standing at my back door, looking into the backyard, thinking of all of this when my eyes locked onto the shed in the backyard, and I remembered the story told to us by the people that we'd talked to whose house had been on the tapes. They found evidence of somebody living in their shed. I went to my room, picked up a sword from my collection, yeah, I'm a nerd, deal with it, and then I went out to the shed. I crossed the yard and when I got to the shed I found it unlocked. I opened the door, looked inside only using the sunlight since there's no power running to it. I immediately saw a pile of trash in the far corner. It was a loose pile of tarps, cloth from umbrellas, and trash bags, and had a compression in the middle like someone had been lying on it. Off to the side of the pile was the missing liquor bottles from the inside of the house and some garbage. This guy had been living in the shed, and it was a good chance that he'd been there since the house had been broken into two months ago. In fact, for all I know, he could have been there the night when I went to the shed for the pitchfork, watching me. I didn't want to freak out my family, so I cleaned it up in secret. At the bottom of the, for lack of a better term, bedding of trash, I found a ratty notebook. I only half opened it to a random page, saw some very familiar artwork, and immediately closed it, tore it up, and threw it in the actual trash. A couple of weeks later, got a phone call from Chris. He said that he was doing some looking around and found some very strange stuff. Before I could say that I didn't want to hear it, he said he went back to the house of the women who had formerly owned his house, who we'd talked to before. Now before I could respond to this, he said they lied. Come see me tomorrow. The next day, without telling my family, I drove back to Chris's house. When I got there, I was greeted by his mother, who seemed to be in a good mood. I asked her how it was going, and knowing what I was talking about, she said that nothing strange had happened in the last couple months. I asked where Chris was, and she pointed to the stairs that led down to his basement bedroom. 
I opened the door and immediately heard him talking, but I couldn't quite hear what he was saying. I just assumed that he was talking to his girlfriend. When I got to a point on the stairs that I could see into his room, I saw that he was sitting in front of his desk, talking to a video camera. I asked him what the hell he was doing, and he smiled and said, nothing. Turned off the camera and slid it between his monitor and his computer tower, like it wasn't strange that he was talking to a camera just like Butcherface did. By this time, I'd gotten to the bottom of the stairs, and Chris stood from his chair and immediately changed the subject. He walked up to me and started talking about how, a couple of days before, he had driven to the house of the old women who used to own his house. When we got there, he parked across the street and waited. He knew that the former owner of the house, Louise, had died and that her sister, if you remember, Shirley, had moved away soon after and that someone had been living in her house since then. He was hoping to see Butcherface either entering or leaving the house. Instead, he saw Shirley pull into the driveway. They got out of their cars at the same time. Uh, Shirley apparently hadn't seen Chris because she just continued to the house. By the time that he caught up to her, she had already gone into the house, but she then began to back out, apparently shocked at something that she saw in there. When he got to her, she was already back on the porch. He started talking to her, and she finally told him what she really knew about Butcherface. Now, like we had already heard before, she started at the point when her sister Louise and her husband bought the house. They wanted to replace the wiring and the plumbing, but before that could happen, Louise's husband had gotten sick, and eventually he died. This was where they left off the story before. What they didn't tell us was that a couple of years after her husband's death, Louise still couldn't afford paying for it, so she decided to sell the house instead. Now, as houses do when you first put them on the market, it sat there with no real interest, so they thought it would be a relatively easy fix. So, they, in their early 60s at the time, mind you, decided to fix it up themselves. When they arrived to check out the house for the first time, they found the house like it looks in the videos. Garbage everywhere, drawings on the walls, burnt out candles absolutely everywhere, and a hole in the basement. They began to clean it up, picking up the garbage, putting up cheap wallpaper, putting down carpeting, and boarding up the hole in the basement as best they could. One thing she did mention that we never noticed is that she said that in the hole in the basement, there was another hole in the cinder block wall in the foundation that led to the backyard. They bricked up this hole, but due to their budget, and she apparently also blamed their old age, they never used any mortar. They just laid the bricks in place and left it at that. Chris asked her if they put the videos in the hole, and she outright denied it. We determined that if anybody knew where that hole in the wall was, they could just remove the cinder blocks and get into the hole and do whatever they wanted there, like hiding some tapes, for instance. We went out to his backyard to see if this was true, and we did indeed find a patch in the cinder block wall where you could remove the blocks. Now they seem to have fresh scrape marks, like they'd been recently moved, but we're not experts, we couldn't be sure. Their conversation continued with her telling him that while cleaning out the kitchen, they found a rectangular object wrapped in tinfoil. They unwrapped it and found that it was a videotape. They brought it back home and popped it in the VCR, watched it. Apparently, there was no picture. The screen was just black, like whoever had taken it had left the lens cap on or something, but it seemed that this was intentional because what the video lacked in visuals, it compensated for with sound. He said that she described it as uh, rants and strange noises for the entire tape. He said, that she then ended their conversation and quickly walked back to her car, leaving the old house's door open and drove away. He then abruptly changed the subject by jumping back to his desk and pulling a folder out of a drawer, opening it up. 
The papers inside were printouts of various disconnected websites showing pictures of stills from videotapes, drawings, photos, and carvings that all looked familiar. He said, look, they're from all over the country, uh, bits of Mexico, bits of Canada. Some of these apparently even appear in some places in Europe. It's like he's traveling around and leaving this stuff wherever he can. Chris then said that he's going to continue his investigation into Butcherface. That investigation continued on for four years until last weekend. This is why I was gone for three days after writing part one. I hate to make this sound cliche, but Chris became pretty obsessed with trying to find out who Butcherface was. His investigation was slow. Finding the occasional picture or video, he even traveled to a town near Denver, Colorado because he believed he found what he called a nest, a place where Butcherface seemed to appear often, much like around our area. But it turned out that he hadn't found much. We were never really sure what was fueling Chris's interest in all of this since he had no more of Butcherface's media anymore since his father had burned it all. Then last week, we found where it was all coming from. I'd come by because we were planning to see Transformers 3, but we never got to go. I pulled into his driveway at the same time as his girlfriend. We both got out of our cars and laughed at the coincidence of both of us getting there at the same time to see the same person and walked into his house. His family was working, so we just walked in and down the stairs to his room. We hung out for a little while, Chris and his girlfriend sitting on the bed with me sitting at the desk. We were chit-chatting and I was spinning in the chair I was in when I happened to notice a tape leaning against the speaker to his computer. I picked up the tape and asked him what this was. He immediately got an oh shit look on his face and that was when his girlfriend got in on the questioning. He finally broke down and admitted that it was the tape that the old ladies had found in the house back in the 80s. He said that when he'd talked to Shirley that time in front of her house where she told him about when they found the tape, she also gave him the tape and he chose to leave that part out of the story four years ago. This was when we knew that he had a problem. We asked him to stop listening to the tape. We asked him to stop this search for butcher face. It didn't do any good. So that next week, that is to say this week, we decided to go to a cabin that his girlfriend's family owns on a lake a couple towns over to finally finish it. We didn't know how right we were. We arrived at the cabin in the afternoon of Monday. Um, it was me, Chris, his girlfriend, and our friend Jesse. That's the mutual friend that I mentioned back in part one. We filled Jesse in on the whole butcher face story as we knew it on the drive down, and he immediately regretted coming along. Chris bought everything that he had on Butcherface, and soon after we got there, he asked if we could watch the last tape one final time. Jesse wanted to see what the fuss is about, and I have to admit, I was curious to check it out myself. The cabin didn't have any cable, phone lines, cell phone signal, or internet access, so the only form of entertainment was to watch movies and they actually had a functioning VCR still there with a decent VHS collection. We popped the tape into the VCR and turned it on. As mentioned before, this tape had nothing visual. It was all audio. It began with clicking sounds like from an insect that would start off slow and then go faster and then slow down and go fast again. It then changed to a quiet talking, like a whisper. The voice talked about how he had an infectious evil and wanted to spread it to his disciples. Then it just faded out like he walked away from the camera. There were more noises of what sounded like animals walking around inside a building and a high screeching noise that lasted for a good five minutes. 
there was more talking where he called people zombies and cows and how only a few were worthy for the pit followed by a jabbering sound like he was humming while wiggling his tongue around. That night, we lit a bonfire and Chris burned every note, picture, schematic, and the last tape that he had about Butcherface. The next day, we spent most of the morning watching movies, regular movies, and then we went out on a rowboat and explored the lake for a couple of hours. We got back and we hung out on the shore with some drinks. I gotta admit, it reminded me of that time I walked into Chris's house and met his mother. She was in such a good mood after not having any problems with Butcher Face anymore. It felt almost exactly like that. At one point, Chris's girlfriend came out and asked if any of us knew where her iPod was. She claimed that she'd left it in its docking bay, one of those ones with the speakers, you know, and that that was also missing. She kept accusing us of hiding it from her. At this point, it was starting to get dark, and we began going back into the cabin one by one. I was the last one in, and I have to admit, I, um, I didn't close the door. Chris and I and his girlfriend were in their room looking for the iPod and its docking station when Jesse, who was still supposed to be out in the living room, yelled, Holy fuck! We ran out into the living room and he said that he had just seen a person run by the open door outside on all fours. Chris's girlfriend rushed to the door, slammed it shut, and locked it. We stood still listening for where this person could have gone when all of a sudden we started hearing loud noises coming from the front deck. It was random noises, like a voice chattering, something like the grinding of a buzz saw, sobbing, all of it in quick succession. We rushed to the door and peeked out the small window and saw Chris's girlfriend's iPod sitting in its docking bay with a power cord going from it to a plug on the outside wall, sitting on the railing to the deck. These sounds, they were all coming from the iPod. Chris opened the door, ran out, and grabbed the iPod off the docking bay, then ran back into the cabin. He gave it to his girlfriend and told her to delete the file that was playing. Now, this would effectively erase every last known piece of media that we knew of by Butcherface. Chris and I then ran to the door, opened it, and yelled that there was nothing left of any of his media that we had. We had destroyed every connection we had to him, and there was no reason to follow us anymore. It stayed quiet for the rest of the night. Then we left that next morning. During the drive home, we started thinking of some things. We believe now that Butcherface wanted us to find those tapes. Maybe not us specifically, but someone. The day that we found those first 24 tapes, we started an avalanche of more and more of his media that began to surface and help the possibility of it spreading to others. He'd mentioned more than once in his media that he wanted to spread his, and I'm quoting here, infectious evil only to his disciples. And we think that what he meant by disciples are the people that have seen his media. Now we say this because he never seems to attempt to hide any of his stuff. And he seems to keep watch over all of those who have seen it. In the notes I saw of Chris's before he burned them, I saw that many of the sightings of him were scary, but never seemed to be actually dangerous. It was like he was just keeping watch over those who have experienced his media. I contemplated not writing out parts two and three of this story because I'm not sure if this counts as spreading that media. Ultimately, I decided to finish it to warn you that if you ever come across anything that even resembles this footage, this audio, this art, these writings, carvings, whatever, that are described in these stories. Do not look at them. When we got back home, Chris decided to tell his family everything that had happened, including the tape that he'd hidden from everyone else, 
and our hypothesis as to who Butcherface is and what he's doing. Chris's brother Evan's face became pale as a ghost, just as pale as the day that he first saw the tapes. We asked him what the matter was, and he said, You know how I said I never converted the tapes to DVDs? Well, I lied. Apparently, he actually did do the conversion at the college after that day that the house was broken into. Thing is, they disappeared. And he later learned that some fellow students had taken them, thinking that it was a school project of some kind, that it looked cool, and they'd made copies. From what he'd heard, those copies had been handed down from person to person, and they'd been copied. And this led to a chain of countless duplicates. See, it turns out that this is a fairly common idea, that concepts, ideas, and patterns of thought can spread like infections or diseases. Mimetic vectors of intellectual infection. What do those folks over at the Foundation call them? Cognito hazards. So stay scary, wildlings. Steer clear of that homemade art house shit and make the most of your nights. <laughs>